Well, everybody seems to be fixated on World War III. There is a potential crisis, or I should say there is a crisis that we're facing. Of course, it's no secret that there has been population decline and mass death over the past several years, and now it seems to be getting pretty bad. Elon Musk has chimed in. But this report is actually interesting because it makes some pretty outrageous claims that Greece is facing a population collapse, which it is, but it's facing this because of excess mortality related to blood clots and strokes. Interesting. Now, I, I've been unable to verify this outside of a few reports. I'm not familiar with the source that is NDTV, but I can tell you this. It is a fact. Greece will collapse. And uh, I suppose this is indicative of what many countries may be facing due to the exact same reasons. Now, <clears throat> whether or not it is blood clot and stroke, I don't know. Stroke is listed previously in the past few years as a main cause of death, the second behind cardiovascular disease. But I don't know what that means. Certainly the implication is that something has caused a massive uptick in strokes. Interesting. But we have seen the mortality rate in Greece skyrocket over the past decade. Now, again, many of you may think, who cares about Greece? I don't live there. I suppose if you're Greek, you care. But for everybody else, I think this is a very serious issue that the rest of us are going to have to contend with and what that will mean economically, globally. And uh, what happens when your native population is no longer having kids and is dying at an excess rate? That is to say, in Greece, at least, the death rate is double, nearly double that of the birth rate. Where does this country go in 20 years? And what does that mean for the rest of Europe? Now, Elon Musk has, of course, chimed in. And in another statement, Bezos and Musk have both said, we need more people. And we do. Here's a story from NDTV. Greece facing population collapse as unexpected deaths soar. Elon Musk reacts. Data by Greece's national statistical agency, Elstat, showed Greece's population will fall by over a million by 2050. Well, I've got the data for you, my friends, but let's read. According to this article from NDTV, the population decline in Greece has reached alarming levels, and it could become the world's first country to suffer population collapse. <clears throat> a new report has said. This started a debate on social media with billionaire Elon Musk joining in and expressing concern. The report paints a scary picture claiming that heart failure, stroke and blood clots and cancer, among otherwise healthy young people, have caused the mortality rates to skyrocket in Greece. Prime Minister Kyriakos Mits Mitsotakis called the prospect of population collapse a ticking time bomb and national threat. Reacting to the report, Mr. Musk said in a post on X, Greece is one of dozens of countries experiencing population collapse due to low birth rates. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an understatement. Population collapse, also known as depopulation, refers to the phenomenon of a sudden and irreversible decline in the number of living people in a society. This is one of the most serious problems we face, not only in Greece, but in the EU as a whole. Finance Minister Kotis Hatsidakis told news, news agency Reuters last week, referring to the rapidly declining population in this country, it is our priority, whatever it takes. Greece's birth rate fell by 30% from 2011 to 2021 to under 84,000 per year, slipping below the death rate, according to the country's National Hellenic Statistical Service, known as Elstat. Al Jazeera said in a report that this represented a loss of nearly 2 billion euros a year in state revenue over the long term, considering each Greek paid an average 5,758 euros in taxes and Social Security contributions. The data further showed that Greece's population will fall by over a million by 2050. All right. Now, of course, I know. When they're claiming that it's stroke, heart attack, etc., a lot of people have a lot of questions. I'll leave those questions up to you. What I can tell you is that according to the World Bank, at least, uh, I actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the World Health Organization. I should, I should pull it up because they've got two different stats. So let's pull up the World Health Organization, Greece deaths. I believe it's World Health Organization. I can show you about right. It is, uh, it is in fact true. So here's what we have. These are, these are the previous, this is 2019. Uh, top cause of death for males is ischemic heart disease, stroke, lung cancers, and lower respiratory infections, followed by chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Very interesting. In 2019. Now, mind you, this is all pre-COVID. I think it's very important to point out. 
But it is true that it's heart disease, stroke, and, uh, and, and, and other issues. Greek prime minister declares national danger over birth decline. I think you need, I, we need to paint a picture here, right? Greece, according to CIA.gov, 12 deaths for every 1,000 in the population as of 2023. Well, okay. How about their birth rate according to macrotrends.net? Current rates, 6.8 births per 1,000 population. It is nearly double. The death rate is nearly double that of the birth rate. Man, that's getting crazy for Greece. And I think it's important we talk about where this goes. Here's the death rate crude per 1,000 people in Greece. As of 2020, it hit 14, and it actually dropped down to 12. But look at this incline. This is pre-COVID. The incline, it's getting bigger and bigger. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk say, population not nearly big enough. If we had a trillion humans, we would have at any time, uh, any given time, a thousand Mozarts. Perhaps, gentlemen, perhaps. Look at their big faces on the screen. Uh, let me tell you where, where we're going. Greece is just one of the first states. The rest is going to be true for everybody else because ain't nobody having kids. And I'll tell you what this means. I took a visit over to uh, Michigan a while ago. Many of you may be aware of what's happening in Michigan. Michigan faced a mass exodus and a population decline. Their water became tainted in Flint and uh, in the surrounding areas. And Detroit ended up with the most expensive water in the country. How could this happen? It's actually quite simple. You see, in order to have luxuries and live like kings, as we do, you need more and more and more people. Why? Well, many hands makes light work. So here's what happens. I'll give you, the, I'll give you a rudimentary breakdown of cost per, uh, per person with a place like Detroit. Let's say you have one million people. And uh, everybody spends $1 per month to maintain the million dollar water system. A $1 ain't no problem, right? You can pay a dollar. So you budget out of your check every week, every, every, every week, just a quarter. All right. Then half the population leaves. Well, now the water system is still $1 million. But you only have half the population. population. So the costs double for everybody. Now, in reality, it was never a dollar, right? So with a million people in this metropolitan area, because they're all connected, Flint was on Detroit water, uh, I believe. It's been a long time since I covered this. You end up with like a million plus people and everyone's spending like 30 or $40 for their water. When the population starts to leave, the total cost is fixed. It stays the same. To operate this massive water machine requires the same amount of people. So what ends up happening is you get your, your, your water bill next month. It's 10 bucks more. And you're like, what? Because of the increased cost, some people are like, guys, water is just too expensive to pay here. I, I, I'm going to move somewhere else. So they do. As the population leaves, as there's no jobs and services become more and more expensive, this makes the services more and more expensive. How are you going to pay for a fire department or a police department? You're going to have to start laying off firefighters. You're going to have such a volunteer fire service. The water became more and more expensive. Eventually, I think it was something that was like over $100 per household or something. Nobody could afford it. The most expensive in the nation. It's not just that. It's all services. Trains. You see, when you have a million people using the train every day and the train costs a million bucks a month, you got a profit. Well, uh, and that's great. So you can now invest in new infrastructure and can expand it. But then the population begins to decline. Now nobody's using the train anymore. The trains start to fall apart. It requires large groups of people to maintain systems like this at, a, at an economic level. And people don't realize this. The managerial power required to run the system we have. How do you get airplanes? It requires a certain population size, period. Imagine you wanted to take the train uh, from downtown to the south side of Chicago. We use, uh, you got a couple, you got the red line goes straight south. You want to go southwest to go to a, uh, you go to a Midway Airport. You've got the orange line. That was my train. Imagine Chicago only had 100,000 people. The train would probably come once every two hours, if that, because that's what they can afford to maintain. Why? Not everybody uses the train at the exact same time. The more people you have, 
the more we can afford more trains. And it becomes extremely convenient for you when a train shows up every five minutes. That's crazy. As the population begins to shrink, you will see the dissolution of core services. And, it, and, it will, and then you will have to start picking up the slack and doing these things on your own. Certain things can't even exist. I think Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk missed the big point when they say if we had a trillion humans, we'd have at any given time a thousand Mozarts. You could do the math and break it down. How do you sustain clean water to an entire population at neg- neg- negligible prices to where it's, it's almost like people say water's free? You go to uh, uh, in some states, in some cities, it is a legal requirement. I believe New York, it's a legal and Arizona. Uh, it's a legal requirement to give someone water. Uh, Arizona makes sense. I don't know if it's true, though, but this is what I was told when I was in Phoenix. If someone walks into a business and says, I need water, you have to give it to them. Well, water's not hard to come by. Why? Because we have these massive systems that we built. What happens when we end up like Michigan and our water system ends up costing us, you know, 10 percent, 20 percent of our of our income? This is where things start to break down, because now you walk into a store and say, I'll have a cup of water. and We'll say that'll be two dollars, please. And they'll be like, I have nothing. I'm dying of dehydration. I'll say, well, too bad. Now, someone may say, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I don't want you to die for sure. But this is something I've pointed out quite a, quite, a, quite a while ago, that when the cost of water exceeds the cost of labor, your society will collapse, period. When the cost of water exceeds the cost of labor. So what this means is, If it ever gets to the point, and perhaps it can't for obvious reasons, perhaps system breaks down before this could happen. If it gets to the point where let's just be real. If water ever reached probably 20 percent of a person's income, your society will collapse. That's it. Food's one thing. You can find food in places you don't like to find food. You can eat the bugs if you have to. You can actually eat certain leaves off trees, but I'm not telling you to do that. You go look up, uh, talk to a nutritionist and figure out which leaves you can eat. There's many leaves we like to eat, spinach leaves, you know, lettuce, things like that. But uh, I was reading about this because I watched the deer eating the leaves all over the area. And I'm like, can we eat those too? And sure enough, I looked up. The answer is yes. You have to eat a lot of them nonstop. And it's probably not enough and you probably will die. But, you know, you'll get some nutrition out of it. And so the point here is this. With lots of people, things become cheap because it's distributed load. And then you end up with water, lots and lots of water. In certain areas, you have wells. And that means you dig deep enough and you're good. You live by a river, you're good. You may have to filter the water. There could be waste runoff and things like that. That's bad. But for a lot of places, if it ever got to the point where water was more expensive, reached a certain threshold, and I bet it's 20 or 30 percent, where you're working just to get a drink of water, people will leave. They'll leave. You can't survive that way. For humans with small populations, we would live near a water source and you could just get a bucket of water and there's nothing to worry about because there was a lot of it. But now we're in big cities where there's no streams. You get water from the faucet. Where does the water come from? Well, there's a water source and it goes through a reclamation plant or a processing center of some sort. But when that machine becomes expensive, what are people going to do? New York doesn't have good water. They don't. It's a big concrete block. And the water, I believe, comes from up north. It flows downward. Uh, and then New York pumps it through, these, through the cities so that people have something to drink. That system is massively expensive to maintain. And what happens when there aren't people to maintain it anymore? The water stops. And when the water stops, the people flee. This is the point about the story of Greece. The population collapses enough, then there will be no one to maintain basic city services. Walking into the center of town, there will be no water. What will you do? Who's going to want to live there? Having to constantly ship in, people will bring in big things. No way. That's too much. The only reason we're able to maintain these big cities where we have water sources miles and miles away is because of these water systems. And if humans don't maintain these water systems, then people will have to go directly to the source for their water, which means these big cities will not exist if population gets too small. And I'm using water only as one example. Everything else makes means the exact same. When people can't maintain public transit, it's going to completely isolate who can work in certain places. Some people like to live in New York and then they work 
you know, they, they, they live in South Manhattan, the financial district, but they work up in uh, Upper West Side or something like that. They need transport. Maybe they ride their bike. What will happen is that people are going to start isolating back around water sources because the cost is too great to maintain these systems. It'll change everything. There's not going to be space travel. There's not going to be the luxuries, you know. You're not going to be able to walk into a grocery store and pick up a thing of beer. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to maintain. That's the crisis we're facing. Now, let's think about what we can do with a larger population. With a larger population, we can go to the stars. Who knows what we can build when we have more and more specialties and specialists? It's kind of crazy to think about. There was a point in time where it was possible to know everything humans knew. Isn't that crazy to think about? For real, if you go back, what, like a couple hundred thousand years to the dawn of humanity, and everything humans knew, you could know. There's uh, trees over there, and there's uh, water over there, and that thing seems to taste good, and there was just no, no there was very limited knowledge. One day a human was like, you know, if I take this here stick and I sharpen it, I can stick things with it, and then I can eat them. And uh, humans are quite good at taking the next step. It's, 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 kinda, it's kind of amazing, really, to watch that innovation is actually a bit more innocuous and rudimentary than people would expect. So, uh, for instance, the first ever drone live stream sounds like a big feat. A live broadcast via aerial drone. Well, I did that with some friends 12, uh, 13 years ago. Uh, this would be 12 years ago. All we did was take the existing technology and change its code a little bit and then fly it and capture the video signal and broadcast it, combining existing technologies into a new thing. And some people would say, that's not invention, that's innovation. But no, I, you are wrong. Invention is almost always innovation. You know, when, when uh, you, it rarely is it that you have some kind of massive scientific breakthrough by a scientist that results in the creation of a new product. A scientist may say, whoa, look at this thing we found, look what it does. But it is typically engineers who invent the new thing with it. Now, don't get me wrong, scientists do invent things quite a bit. Uh, the space race got us a bunch of really awesome stuff. I think plastics, paper towels, the ballpoint pen, things like that. And uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I could be wrong about the pen, but I think the, I think the pen is right. So science does, does these wonderful things for sure. But it's a lot of engineers. It's people who take existing ideas and products. I mean, take a look at the combustion engine. Is it like the combustion engine was invented? Or was it that somebody looked at the steam engine and said, is there an alternate fuel source, a denser fuel source, another way to, to make this thing work? And the combustion engine is really just, take a look at the, the old school trains shoveling coal to boil the water. The steam engine, which would then, you know, drive the wheels of the train. And the combustion engine was just the next step. Can we just cut the water out of it somehow? The steam engine was someone discovering steam pressure. And then we take steam pressure and we spin a wheel to generate electricity with large rotating uh, magnets. All of it is is standing on the shoulders of, of giants. The people who came before us put one piece in front of the other, and then we added our one piece in front of that. It's actually not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Take a look at like the ring camera, for instance. Was the ring camera invented or was it an application of methodology? I love this video where the uh, ring camera guy goes to Shark Tank and they're like, your idea is stupid. Then he came back like eight years later as a shark and a billionaire because the ring idea was a great idea. The ring camera was a great idea. What's the ring camera? It's a uh, basically a cell phone camera. Yeah, that's that's what it is. You stick it to the front of your door, connects to your Wi-Fi. And when someone presses the button, it just sends a beep to your phone. That doesn't sound like he invented anything. It sounds like he made an app. You can stick a smartphone to your door. Well, he, he applied it. He specialized. He took what existed with camera tech and Wi-Fi. And he said, let's stick this to your door and then have it uh, send you a message. The batteries last a really long time. It's fairly impressive. But it's a brilliant invention. It is. This is all possible thanks to the specialties of individuals. If the chip manufacturer didn't exist, if the battery manufacturer didn't exist, if the camera manufacturer didn't exist, ring camera would be nothing. Now, of course, when you look at companies like McDonald's, they make their own stuff. They make their own mayonnaise and their own forks or whatever, their spoons, for sure. But for the most part, what we're looking at is innovation. 
adding one piece to the next piece. That's all it is. And there are some things that are uh, great advances, but they're all just one grain of sand added to the heat by other humans. This is why I agree with Bezos and Elon Musk. But I would take it one step further, my friends. If we had a trillion humans, we'd have we'd have we, we'd, we'd be a galactic species. One trillion humans all working towards if, if networked and communicating, we would be able to build wonders beyond imagination. Imagine telling people 100 years ago, 100 years ago, about jumbo jets and, and, and satellites. And it is because of population expansion and hyper specialization we're able to do this. In the future with a trillion people, there might be one guy who's like, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a circuit reconfiguration specialist. My job is quite literally just this one tiny thing. How many, how many people does it take to, take to make a, a pizza? Is the, uh, is the idea. Someone to make the cheese, someone to make the sauce, someone to make the bread. And of course, there is one chef who can do it all. There is. But these days, that's not how it operates. Papa John's sources their, their wheat. They source their tomato sauce already, you know, mushed and mi- mixed and all that. And they do good stuff. They get some of the best ingredients. And they don't make the cheese. They bring it all together. The funny thing is, a lot of the food that we eat, impossible impossible without massive population. I love how some of these dishes require spices from the Far East and grains from the Far West, animals that are not native to this region, all mashed together and we eat like kings. Thanks to massive transportation and hyper-specialization. So why should you be concerned about population collapse? Because in the end, you will live in the pot and you will eat the bugs. And they say you'll be happy. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 6 p.m. on this channel. Thanks for hanging out and I'll see you all then.